security professionals are drowning in activities. Not all of those activities can be valuable. What should security professionals stop doing to get back some time? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series, and joining me for this very episode is Steve Zalewski. Steve, could we hear the sound of your voice? Hello, audience. Looking forward to another Defense in Depth episode. Our sponsor for today's episode is Thinkst. Do you know that Thinkst was one of our very first sponsors of the CISO series? Great to have them back again. You may know Thinkst because they do those canary deception devices. So know when it matters, which probably is early on. Anyways, you're going to hear more about Thinkst and their deception technology later in the show. But Steve, uh, I actually post this question on Twitter, and we were talking about it in an old episode, and I said, oh, this would be a great episode all on its own. And what tool or process should we stop doing to get back time? In essence, what is the most, as you said, ineffective, inefficient, obsolete time waster you would get rid of if given the chance? And the thing I thought was interesting, you said, if we had a magic wand, thinking that that's the only way we're going to get rid of this, if we have a magic wand. So I've collected the best responses, and I'm eager to get you and our guests' response on this. What was your first take? So when I posed the question, like you said, I did the magic wand because my objective here was we got to get outside the box, All right? Everything we do in security adds some value. It's all insurance policies. And so kind of my visualization was I'm now sitting here looking at 100 different insurance policies I've taken. And I'm spending an awful lot of money and time on it. And at some point, you have to just say, I can't do that anymore because I need to do new things. So how do I make the magic wand? What do I want to go away? In order to be able to realize this is not an easy question, but it's a brutal question that we really have to start to answer, right? And be honest with ourselves. Excellent point. Steve, and I'm thrilled that you suggested our guests for today's episode to discuss this. And it is Jim Rutt, who is the CISO over at the Dana Foundation. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, David. Pleasure to be here. Does anyone have a better solution? Your own Levy, CISO over at Dolby, said, quote, any tool that I can move to the cloud and consume it as SaaS or PaaS will be a candidate. I'd rather not spend security resources on doing system administration of boxes. And Jarek Beeson, CISO of Epic, he also echoes that feeling. Hardware and OS maintenance of servers and appliances, hosting security tools, if it can safely and securely be done using a cloud-based solution, I will go that route anytime. And Carlos Rodriguez adds, anything homegrown that needs a lot of resources to maintain. So, very much adding to what your own and Jarek said, but there's more to Carlos's comment as well. Steve, your take on this. So what I really liked about these answers was I always think about it as people, process, and technology. And what you saw here was a really nice blend of, is there a way that I can simplify the operations of my infrastructure? That will potentially save me money. It will save me time. It will potentially save me people. So I thought a very practical way for everybody to just take a sweep through your organization and make sure there isn't some low-hanging fruit here that you can take advantage of. And and Jim, this seems like just really the reason the cloud has taken off for simplification and taking things off of my plate. Yes? I totally agree with what Steve had mentioned, but I think the first statement really encapsulates a lot of the core savings from a cost perspective, but also with the added benefit from a security mindset would be the reduction in attack surface for your organization, because it implies that you have much less artifacts or much less items to have to defend against. And the second point that I'd like to add there as well is it simplifies the discussion of your attack surface, your infrastructure, et cetera, with peers that may not be as technically savvy, and it makes it much easier to discuss your risk posture in a more story-like fashion rather than trying to go through a bunch of techno babble. Excellent point. Damn, I'm glad I had you on, Jim. How do we go about measuring the risk? 
Jerome Levy again, CISO over Dolby, said, those security rating tools that scan third parties from the outside and assign a score with no context, dealing with the aftermath of those is a huge waste of time that continues to grow, unfortunately. And Jonathan Waldrop over at Inside Global said, third party risk reviews. They're, quote, necessary from a due diligence standpoint, but they're not really that helpful in preventing or predicting a breach or incident. And David Effering of a Resource Pro said, due diligence questionnaire. So there's been a lot of backlash against third-party risk management scores, but at the same time, we need to know about third-party risk. Yes, Jim? I totally concur with the statements here, especially with the services that are well-known in the marketplace. I think there are limitations, obviously, when you're trying to measure risk from the outside in, as well as relying or over-reliance on the typical risk frameworks that are currently very popular out there. I think one of the things that I've been trying to uh, promulgate or try to promote more and more is to enhance these purely quantitative risk frameworks with a more qualitative story-based enhancement or enrichment because they make a lot more sense in terms of imputing context to the board. And as we all know, the board and the executive suite are the ultimate arbiters of what acceptable risk is for our organizations, respectively. We always have to look in terms of measuring our risks, be it a register or otherwise, to align to what they want. And they are not going to be able to give us a proper read on what risk is acceptable unless we're very good at communicating it with them in, in a very easy manner. So, Steve... There is this backlash against the rating numbers, but at the same time, if we're going to, quote, drop this, we need to still worry about third-party risks. So if we're removing this, what are we going to do that's going to be as simple as just looking at a number to see how secure, not secure someone is? So I'm going to take the question in a slightly different way, because the way you said it is a legitimate question, and what Jim said is true as well. But this topic is about how do you simplify? What do you stop doing in order to do something else? And I think the point here is we're required now to measure more and more third-party and imputed fourth-party risk as you're becoming cloud-centric or cloud-neutral or cloud-enabled. And everybody's saying it's hard. Well, what good is a due diligence questionnaire? Because we all know that the answers don't mean anything. It takes a lot of time and we chase everybody. And yet, the tooling that's out there to do third-party risk is immature. That's what I mean. Hard question. Stop doing the questionnaires. Leverage the immaturity of the tooling that's out there to be able to at least have the conversation that while I'm responsible for the third-party and fourth-party risk, I have very little visibility and very little ability at this point to manage it as a result of digital transformation. That's okay. And that's allowing you to stop wasting time on something that everybody knows really doesn't work, but that we all feel obligated to provide some evidence that we follow due diligence. It's a hard conversation to have, but it's an example of where I'd say, if you're really up against the wall, that's an interesting conversation you can have with yourself and your team. I agree wholeheartedly here, but going back to the original theme of today's discussion is we're trying to make things easier. And I don't know if things would be easier here. I think it'd be a hell of a lot more complicated. Yes, Steve, Jim, I'll, I'll give both of your quick comments on this. Well, I, I would totally agree, but I think it goes in line with the common thinking that automating any kind of aspect of any kind of these conversations or measurements is the only way to get an accurate source of that truth, so to speak. It might turn out that by automating a lot of these things, we're actually making it a lot more difficult because we really can't rely on the efficacy or the, the fidelity of these measurements. And I think, yes, there is a, a perfect place for automation in most organizations. I think where it's overutilized is in the most, I would say, the soft center of all our organizations when it comes to risk management, which is the human factor. I think it's very important to understand that business alignment is certainly one very important item for any CISO to make sure that whatever they're doing within their programs, within the risk management to be perfectly aligned. But I think you have to move from business alignment to more of a business intimacy posture where you really have to understand 
like Steve said, the people and the process part of that of that triad of people, process, technology, because all these different elements of a of a attack surface or internal or inside threat, a lot of that stems from the lack of understanding not only what our internal users do, but why they do it and how they interact with each other. And we can't sit in the hothouse anymore and just rely on automated tools like automated phishing tools is one of the biggest things that come to mind. It's great to measure these things. It's great to use them. But to make those the sole arbiter of risk posture management as to how we are educating our end users in this area, there's more than that. I think most CISOs already know that part of the problem is everyone thinks security is a hot area. Every technology company now wants to be a security company because it's hot. This is Haroon Mir, founder of Thinkst. His company is famous for the Canary, a unique technology that runs in the background everywhere, waiting for intruders and detecting them before they dig in. His concern is that CISOs today have a hard time separating truly great security products from the noise. In a market that already had too much of noise, you now get more noise. And it becomes really hard for practitioners to tell the difference. One of those that I feel particularly strongly about, and I think CISOs can help do something about, is the number of products that subscribe to fake awards. If you know your vendor will be dishonest to make a sale, like why would you choose them as your vendor? We've accepted stuff like that for a really long time, and I think CISOs need to push back on that stuff. Most of the people who got into security got in with some piece of idealism where you kind of want to make the world a better place. And this is one of those places where I think CISOs can correct things with their money. They can nudge that back to normal. For more information about Thinkst and Canary, visit thinkst.com. That's T-H-I-N-K-S-T dot com. Aspects haven't been considered. Jonathan Waltrup of Insight Global again said, quote, the sales cycle. There's so much time spent on the song and dance. That one, I think we all wholeheartedly can agree on. Ding, 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 I think ding, I think ding, he might have the winner for the <laughs> right there. Abhishek Singh of Arali Network said, could we all agree to retire passwords and the policies around them? I know there's a lot of passion around that. And Devin Ertel CISO over at Menlo Security said compliance, quote, check the box activities that do not actually reduce risk. So these are three random ones. Steve, your take on this. And and by the way, are there other random ones that we have not discussed that you would suggest? So what I liked about this was it wasn't to simplify, right? The challenge was wave your magic wand to do less so that you can figure out where to focus on the most important insurance policies that you have to take to protect your company. And I think these three are great out-of-the-box ways to really understand what we were driving at with the question. Every one of those, nobody will argue, is an insurance policy, but it is low value. And so this is where I would say you sit down with your team. And you say, what are we going to do about sales and marketing and all this stuff coming in? Are we going to sinkhole a lot of this stuff automatically, right? What are we going to do for the overall organization to reduce that time sink? I think it's great about compliance and check the box. My goodness, think about all the manual processes many people have to do their annual assessments where you can just realize it's not worth it, that you can accept the risk because you have compensating controls. And you can save 10 or 20 or 100 or 200 man hours to be able to focus on something else. So I think what I liked about this was here were three great ways to start that out of the box thinking with your teams to be able to figure out how you do less. Jim, your take on these. I would totally concur with what Steve said, especially with these rather rote automated processes around paperwork and checkboxes that rarely, if any, are are scrutinized to any level of detail. I think it's just a matter of being in this certain habit of just collecting the data, thinking by the mere collection of it, 
they impute some kind of uh, level of risk management or risk mitigation. And I think it's certainly time, once again, and I don't like to beat a dead horse, but to make it more conversational between parties and counterparties about the real risks that are perceived and known in these relationships. Make it quick, make it short, have the proper metrics where needed, but make them relevant. Here, here. This problem doesn't end here. Mark Wojtasiak of Code42 said, stop blocking legitimate work and stop blaming how users work. By the way, many people echoed this last one, like Andrew Lockhart of Ifani, stop blaming end users. And Mike katz Lakabi said, stop chastising users when our controls fail to protect them. And lastly, Abhishek Singh again from Morali Network said, tough question, though, which is essentially our initial question of what to stop doing, because... No wonder security is so hard. It's difficult to retire anything. And I think that is the theme and why you had to use the word magic wand, Steve, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and what I... May, may I ask you this before we go on? Have you successfully retired anything? Yes, but not for the reason that you would think. Okay. So we didn't retire something because it no longer became useful. What we were able to do is we would retire some products because we replaced them with superset products as our posture changed. And therefore, we were very conscious of understanding when we were purchasing a product that we might only be using it for a year or 18 months. But that gets you into a lot of trouble potentially with CapEx, OpEx, and how you spend. And that gets to the conversation of efficiency versus effectiveness. So yes, we did multiple times, but it wasn't without us first understanding the arguments that we were going to take to be able to show how we were effectively protecting the company, not just trying to secure our company. Jim, I'm throwing this to you. So to, to follow on Steve's lead there, and he laid it out so ably, I think we get to a point where we use these tools and the data or whatever perceived value that come out of them certainly gets limited to a point where we start to question why we even pay the maintenance on these tools, much less the the fees for them. But in terms of looking at some of the items here in terms of blaming end users and, and chastising end users, I think it's long time that we start forming allyships with our end users rather than segregating ourselves in our own little hothouse mm -hmm. and realizing that our end users, at least this is my perception, is that they are hungry to get involved in these things based on the types of stories that they can read just in the mainstream news about all these different security events. They just don't know how. And with not a lot of effort, but a lot of commitment from our perspectives as practitioners, we can enable them to become great allies and great effective controls in and of themselves in this crazy world that we, we find ourselves in. We don't do that enough. Do you think it's actually become easier this past year? Because one of the things I've noticed, especially in 2021, I mean, we definitely saw it at the previous year, but this year, the amount of cyber news in the mainstream was explosive in 2021. As a result, I'm sure end users had seen it all and read it, a lot of it. Has this conversation become easier as a result, Steve? No, it's become more common but we're not good yet at taking the opportunity to have these conversations and focus them as effectively as we can to wave the magic wand. And what I would say is every time the conversation starts with, are we secure or are we safe, which is well, most of the conversations, that is not the one that you can answer. Are you prepared to be able to say, well, here's what I can do to protect the company. Here's the investments. Here's my insurance policies. Here's what I'm stopping doing because it is just not effective enough compared to something else I could do. That's what I mean, which was treat security like a business that's supposed to enable the business, not just secure the business and really be a business partner where you think about your profit protection or loss prevention as opposed to audit and compliance reporting. Jim, going back to my original question said to Steve, I mean, you can echo or, or comment on what Steve said, but I, I want to know if 
all this news has helped the conversation or hurt the conversation? I think it's helped, at least from the perspective of the mainstream media is doing half the work for us. They're at least bringing these issues to the forefront, to the everyman, to our end users, where they typically would not know about these things or haven't known about them at, say, 10, 15 years ago. Right. But I would totally agree. Oh, with, no, by the way, I would say two years ago, even. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I concur. But I would concur with Steve as well as that we're not taking the ball and running with it from that perspective towards the goal line, which is to get them more either educated or more ready to be able to close that gap because this is still the largest gap that – in my personal opinion, there's no tool or automation that's going to fill it in and of itself. It requires work, dedication, community building, and understanding the power of relationships and education to help stop this madness. Agreed. Well, let's wrap up the show at this point. And this is where I ask both of you what your favorite quote was and why. And I'm going to start with you, Jim. Do you have a favorite quote and why? I, I like your own quote about using tools that could be moved to the cloud. I, we were a very early cloud adopter. We had started about eight or nine years ago, believe it or not, and finished our journey about six or seven years ago. And I totally agree. It makes life so much easier for the reasons that I had talked about previously, but as well as the fact that it's just easier to run in any kind of business interruption situation of which I think we just had a minor one for the past couple of years. But in the New York area where we are, this is actually the fifth major one in the past 22 years. So it's nothing new. And I'm glad this paradigm is finally coming to light. People are leveraging it. I certainly am a proponent. Steve? So I'm going to go with Devin Ertel, CISO at Menlo Security. Great guy. And compliance, check the box activities that do not reduce risk. That is a sacred cow in many companies. It's where the money comes from for security, but it's also a great place where there's inefficiencies as a result. And if you as a CISO are trying to protect your company, go ahead and take a look there. And I'm gonna bring in Log4j. That was a while back, but how many people are still fighting it at this point? Because they're trying to determine how they're gonna manage their legal and regulatory compliance. And that's a whole lot of check the box process that they need to figure out enough is enough. And so I say, this is a great opportunity to realize, to dig in somewhere that's gonna have a lot of potential opportunity to wave your magic wand. Excellent, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Jim. I wanna thank our sponsor, Thinkst. They are the makers of the Canary tools. We love those. They're awesome. And we love Thinkst as well. The I believe they're canary.tools, is there they, how you can actually get to them. but. I'm going to let you, Jim, have the final word. Steve, any last thoughts? I just want to thank Jim. Great topic, right? Wave the wand. I thought some great out-of-the-box thinking. I really appreciate, Jim, you taking the opportunity to join us and provide some feedback. Steve, it's an honor to follow you in any way, shape, or form, especially on all these roundtables. As a final thought, I, once again, I'm just going to harp on the fact that us as security practitioners, we definitely need to understand that we have to be more integrated, more intimate with our business operations and to foster a more whole sense of community when we're discussing these, these very, very important issues. And they are going to keep coming and we have to be readier and we have to... We have to be on top of this stuff. And I think the best way to do it is, is as an army, not as a solo. Well said. We're behind you on that one. By the way, are you hiring over at the Dana Foundation, Jim? Uh, not yet, but you never know. Come 2022, yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jim Rudd, who's the CISO over at the Dana Foundation, and my co-host, Steve Zalewski. And I also want to thank all our listeners for supporting the CISO series and our show. So thanks, all, as always, for your contributions and listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.